it's really the real estate dream, right? Right. Why everybody got into the business in the first place, which is um, having the time back and being able to be a business owner instead of a, an operator. Hello, welcome to episode 203 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by returning guest and founder of the Listings Lab, Jess Lenovell. After actively selling real estate for 15 years, Jess launched the Listings Lab six years ago and has helped countless agents scale their businesses into the ones they've always dreamed of. Throughout our conversation, Jess shared her advice on how new agents should be investing their resources to better set themselves up for success, why you should be focusing on organic social media with your marketing, and tips for scaling your real estate business. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story of real estate success or tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new guests to inspire our listeners. And lastly, if you enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more, be sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents Podcast. We stream on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. All right, let's get on with our conversation with Jess Lenovell. Be sure to check out her new book, More Listings, Less Hustle, Becoming the Seven-Figure Real Estate Agent. I have a link for it in the episode description. Well, really the way I like to start everything out is if you could reintroduce yourself to us. It's been a while uh, since we last had you on, so just uh, kind of give us a, a you know brief backstory on yourself. 100%. So Jess Lenovell, I know that nobody can pronounce that last name when you read it. So I thought I'd do that for you. Um, yeah, so um, quick intro. So I grew up in the real estate industry. So mom has had a real estate license for 35 years now, I think. I was that kid that like grew up in the back of the car getting dragged around. Everything in, uh, in my childhood kind of revolved around real estate. I got my license when I was 21 and I sold real estate actively for 15 years, built a multi seven figure, very lean team. Um, hundred percent of our business was generated online at a time when, you know, it wasn't as common. Mm -hmm. And, uh, six years ago now I started the company that I currently run, which is called the listings lab. We have multiple levels or layers of programming, depending on what agents need. So we've got a program that takes agents from, you know, up to six figures. We have our six to seven figure marketing program, which is 100% marketing. And then we have our seven figure agent programs that are really geared towards scaling, um, getting that team lead out of production and really focused on kind of that unlimited scalability it's really the real estate dream, right? Right. Why everybody got into the business in the first place, which is um, having the time back and being able to be a business owner instead of a, an operator. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like, you know, so many of the people that I've talked to over the years, you know, everybody's, I mean, I think I can probably count on maybe one hand, the amount of people that got into real estate, like straight out of school. It's, you know, that career change and people are looking it's very, for very, very infrequent for sure. Right. And, but so many times people get into it and they find themselves right back into a quote unquote career yeah. and just, you know, working, working it's that the grind. time. Point. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think too, you know, I've been, I've watched a couple of people in the last couple of years and there's so many people coming into this as a second, third, sometimes fourth, you know, fourth career. Um, but it's always the people who have a background in business who really shine because they start out right from day one building a business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people who come from corporate or who don't have that business background, they tend to build themselves a job. Right. And, and, and I think that the approach is always so interesting because it varies so much where having that entrepreneurial viewpoint or spirit coming into mm -hmm. as, especially as an, as a new agent building something for the first time, um, the approach is just drastically different. Um, they're looking for resources and training and skills and skill development in places that a lot of other people aren't. And it's, yep. it's cool to see, it's cool to see how, um, those business minded people tend to thrive so fast. Right. So with that, for, you know, uh, somebody that is looking to get into real estate or maybe has just started, um, what are some of the things that they can do to kind of set themselves up on that path to be 
more entrepreneurial rather than, Mm -hmm. you know, getting back in that cycle? I think the first thing is to really set things up like a business from day one. And Mm -hmm. I I did a training on this this morning, so it's so it's fresh. Um, I think there's still people in who've been in real estate for 10, 15 years who are still treating every commission check like personal income. And they never separate the business money and the personal money. And so the business never has any money. And so I think that the way that we allocate resources, resources being time, energy, money, relationships, the way that we allocate those things has to be really, really strategic and efficiency has to become really the most important thing. Efficiency in terms of how you're spending your money and how you're spending your time and where you're learning from. And, you know, I know that that can sound cliche as someone who owns a training company, but (laughs) uh, I'm aware. Um, But I think that so many people rely so heavily on their brokerage. And so many people go about things from such a traditional route that Mm -hmm. instead of really thinking about if you do things the way that 99% of people do things, then you're going to get the same results as 99% of the people around you. And then people don't understand why they're struggling or why their business isn't growing when they're working really hard at the same things that everyone else is working really hard at. And so if you do the same thing as everyone else, you're going to get the same results as everyone else. And there's a lot of really, you know, highly struggling agents out there. And so I think a lot of it comes down to, again, efficiency and allocation of resources and not coming into something like real estate and expecting to be able to build a big business with no capital. This is one of the only industries that I find that people come into it and think I don't have to spend any money in order to set my business up, which there's not a, there's not a single business in the world that doesn't need some funding in the beginning as a startup. And, you know, I I think again, that's where a lot of the inefficiency sort of starts is it's uh it's treated like a hobby and not necessarily treated as a business. Yeah, absolutely. I really like what you said there about, you know, uh, it's one of the few businesses out there, you know, if you, if you watch what everybody else is doing, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And really, I mean, in this one, it is a known fact. What is it like 87% of people fail out in a certain amount yeah. of years or so. And it's, like, it's like, it's like, it's like within the first two years. Right. And so yeah. it's like, I would not be looking you know, to my don't side, watch, for- don't watch everyone else around you. They're, they're like, they're not, they may not be there in two years. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, with that in allocating your resources and making sure that you are spending money in the right ways. And what are, what are some of those things that, you know, agents should be investing on early on mm-hmm. in their real estate career? I think skills, skills and mm-hmm. knowledge. Um, you know, I, I said this morning to someone that it wouldn't matter what happened in my life. It wouldn't matter if my house burnt down, my insurance wouldn't pay for it. It wouldn't matter if all of my investments, you know, someone hacked into my profiles and all my investments disappeared, I would still be okay. And the reason why I will always be okay is because I have marketing skills and I have an audience and those are my insurance is I will always be able to rebuild and scale quickly. And because I know what I'm doing and I have that skill set. I think that a lot of people approach real estate from like a place of luck and they rely uh, on friends and family to build their business for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very volatile, very stressful way of building anything. And, you know, when we see things like inconsistent, uh, inconsistent uh, interest rates or, um, you know, shifts in the market or any kind of uncertainty, you will find that you start to really ride that roller coaster and yeah. there's nothing more stressful than lack of stability in a business. So right. I really think that being able to invest early on in yourself, in your skills, in knowing that you can rely on your own knowledge, your own expertise and your own, your own know-how to yeah. navigate whatever kind of comes at you. Um, and then everything else, you know, I think people, you can get to a point where you're automating and you're outsourcing and you're doing all of those things, but that's not number one. The number one thing is that you've got to get to a point where, you know, you yourself are solid. Um, Alex Hermosi has a quote that is, you're not making as much as you want because you're not as good as you think you are. Mm -hmm. And it's harsh, but I think it's so true. And 
you know, if you're not making what you really truly think that you should be making, or you're not at a level that you're really, really happy to cruise at, um, I, I, I think that skill increasing skill set and like learning has to come first. And you should only be outsourcing things or hiring out things once you scale to a certain level. And you already know how to do that job. Yeah. You can already wear that hat and you can then monitor and train and be in control of every single aspect of your business. And you're not hiring something out that you don't know how to do yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think especially, you know, just when thinking marketing wise to know how to craft, you know, even if it just comes to then you emails, know if it's bad, right? right? Well, and then, but also if you know how to do that and you know, you have a framework of putting together converting emails, you can change those emails a bit depending on what the market's doing. A hundred percent. And you're not waiting on some company or some copywriter who probably doesn't know your business, doesn't know real estate super well, doesn't know your market to try to make some adjustments. Um, and I think that that's really where we end up in situations where marketing doesn't convert is when there's some sort of third party copywriter trying to write something from lack of knowledge or, you know, lack of understanding of the audience. And also just lag time. You know, someone else, you know, if you can get if you can hop in and you can make an adjustment in five minutes, as opposed to waiting for someone for three days to make an adjustment, that's also going to cost you 50 to a hundred dollars to make that. Adjust. I just think that it's just, it, there, again, there's a, like an efficiency standpoint. Um, and I hear all the time from agents like, oh, I, I, I tried running Facebook ads and they didn't work. I'm like, did you try running Facebook ads? And did you, did you master Facebook ads or did you hire a company to run Facebook ads for you? And they didn't convert. And what was the messaging and who was the target demographic? And, you know, what was the sales psychology that, that, that you had built into that? And they can't answer those questions because they don't actually even know what it means. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, you know, just being able to going back to the email thing, just being able to craft an engaging headline and knock out the email. You know, if you can do that yourself, let's say all of a sudden this afternoon, something crazy happens with interest rates. You're I don't the first. Have to, right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't have to go to my third party say, okay, this is what I want. Let's get back, you know, get back to me. And then they get it back to you in what, three days. Well, by the time you get it out, there's it's not news other, anymore. <laughs> right. And there's 15 other emails in yeah. people's inboxes with the right. same thing. Exactly. Exactly. I think that, you know, speed of execution just for any business is the one of the prime indicators for success. I, you know, I say all the time, like, you need to be speed. And the faster that you can do something, the faster you can get something out there, the faster you can iterate, the faster that you're collecting data, um, the more effective you're, especially from a marketing standpoint, the more the most the more effective it's going to be. Um, so many people struggle with perfectionism. You know, even if they are doing it themselves, they're not moving fast enough and they're struggling with their perfectionism and they're, 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 they're rewriting the same email 50 times. And then by the time it gets out, it's not relevant anymore. It's not timely anymore. And, you know, they're not going to then take that same email that they've rewritten 50 times and rewrite it another 50 times. Right. right? So, so they're not, they're never actually perfecting it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, talking about uh, marketing more in a broad uh, sense, you know, in today's, you know, in today's world and uh, how things have evolved over the last several years, um, where do you think agents need to be focusing their mm -hmm. marketing efforts? Social media. Yeah. I think that that's where just that's where the majority of attention is. That's where the the majority of people spend time. Um, I think that it's also free. <laughs> you know, I mean, talk about like cost ROI. Um, I just think that there's so much attention. And we've gotten to a point where you do have to be a good marketer, though. You can't break through the noise. And there's so much noise on social media. It's where the most eyeballs are. It's the most attention. It's the most like it's the most kind of captive audience that you can build for free. Um, and I think social media and, and, and I will always say email. And I love that you brought up email before because it doesn't matter how how huge your audience is or how engaged your audience is, you don't own that audience. Right. So you should always be driving to email as well because, you know, email is the only list that you own. Right. Um, so I think a combination between 
a few, not every single social media platform, right? Again, it comes down to who are you trying to target? Um, if you're trying to work with downsizers and seniors and you, you don't need to be on TikTok, that's just not going to be the platform for you. But really understanding and mastering two social media networks that are really going to be the target demographic of the people that you want to attract and email. I think for a lot of people, that's enough to build a seven figure business. That's enough to really, if you do it well, you understand sales psychology, you understand content marketing, um, and you're consistent, mm -hmm. then, you know, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity because so many agents are doing it badly. Right. So with the social media, and I, I like that you brought up the, you know, the free parts of social media, not just like going all in on Facebook ads. And No, no. And so... If somebody's saying, okay, or somebody's listening to this and like, man, you know, my, my business account, I only have like 200 followers. Like, I just don't have a lot of people on there. What would you say to them about the fact that if you're just consistent and you're putting your stuff out there, mm -hmm. how, how broad that reach actually can become even with those, that small follower account? I mean, it, yeah, it depends on the platform for sure. Um, I'm a really big believer that your Facebook business page is a useless place to, mm -hmm. um, to try to build something organically. You're on the business side of Facebook and Facebook wants you to pay to play. But your personal profile, however, is a tremendous marketing asset. You have 5,000 spots there that you can really like nurture and engage people. Um, Instagram, let's just let's just say that your two preferred platforms for the demographic that you want to work with are, is Facebook and Instagram. Um, that makes it easy because they're both meta. They're both owned by the same parent company. But organically, you know, you, let's say that you, this is the, the analogy that I use. Sometimes people are like, oh, you know, I don't want to like spend all this time and energy creating content. I only have 200, I only have 200 followers. And I'll say to people, the content comes before the audience, mm -hmm. right? And if you had 200 people sitting in a room in front of you, would you pay attention to what you were saying to them? Right. Right. 200 people in a room feels like a lot of people, 200 people online. I think we've lost track of vanity metrics. Um, mm -hmm. I know people who have five, 500 to a thousand followers and pull seven figures from that audience every year. Right. It's not really about the size of the audience. It's really about the quality of the audience. Now, if you have 200 followers and 200 of them are other real estate agents, then we need to, you know, readjust and, and, and get some of the right people in there. But um, I think a lot of people put way too much weight on likes and comments and, and, and audience size when the reality of that is that there are people who are absolutely killing it from a business standpoint, from social media, and those are not the things that they're focused on. I really think that creating really good content and content that people want to consume is how you are going to get more people. Right. It's not the other way around. So, like I said, the the content comes before the audience. Right. Absolutely. You have to earn that audience. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know about you, but I know when I go on Facebook, I don't it takes me forever to like scroll through until I actually see somebody I know anymore. I feel like I'm being served like other people's, you know, like my my circles circles now. And it's yeah, like I don't, I don't know who these people are, but they're popping up. Yep. And I, and, you know, I think too, that, um, you know, Facebook groups are such a powerful tool. Um, I think that we just need to get out of this billboard mentality when it comes to real estate and stop treating social media like a billboard and actually start treating it like a social networking platform. And, uh, Facebook groups are, are one of the most powerful ways that you can, that you can build community and you can build like a trusted audience. We have people who, you know, have moms groups, like local moms groups that they run. And we've set their personal profiles up in a way that like makes it very clear what they do and who they serve and all of, all of that. And they're, and like really high quality content on their personal page. And they're doing seven or eight deals a month from a, from a mom's Facebook group. And how, how it's, it's not a tremendous amount of time and energy to maintain a Facebook group like that. And yet so many people are just, you know, spamming real estate Facebook groups with just listed, just sold posts instead of like really creating something of their own. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even in our neighborhood here, we have, you know, every HOA in America, I feel like has a Facebook group now. Totally. And we have, there's a, a couple that lives down the street from us and they are in that Facebook group all the time, but it is strictly like they are there just to provide value, help people yeah. out. But, but their picture, known. 
but their picture is their nice, shiny, uh, you know, headshots. And everybody knows you click on their page and there's a banner up there. It yeah. says exactly what they are. Yeah. And they, they're never in there selling. No, and you don't need to be. Right. People make decisions emotionally before they make them logically. And if you are just like a well-known, great top of mind person who provides value and like isn't coming at them like a sleazy agent, then chances are like the business is there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked, uh, you know, a bit about, you know, kind of setting yourself up, you know, to be more entrepreneur minded in marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But really, I want to talk, you know, the the next topic I want to talk about is that scaling up for those people that, you know, are have been in their career for a while, but they want to take that next step to, you know, whether it is launching their own team or Mm -hmm. just, you know, hitting a a bigger number, a bigger amount of listings. Like what what are some of your, uh, you know, kind of steps for, uh, scaling up in a way that is, you know, a going to be successful, but like sustainable also not burn people out. Yeah. I think that there's, um, there's a couple of ways to go about this. And there, it's kind of a chicken and the egg scenario mm-hmm. because some people will wait until they have too much business and then they'll hire out of desperation and then that person's not trained well and they're not, um, they're not representing them well. And then they, whether, you know, we, we see two sides of it. They go the admin side and then the hiring and training and onboarding an administrator is not a, like a small job. Uh, and then on the other side of it, we're like, we see people who are just like giving business away and not training that person and not getting, you know, not setting standard operating procedures for every part of how they deal with that client and the, they're not being taken care of the way that they should. So I've always, I, I've, I've always asked the question of in your current systems. So in your current business today, with the systems that you have, with whatever support team you may or may not have, if I drop 50 deals on you today, not leads, like 50 active clients on you today, what happens? And if anything would break or you wouldn't be able to deliver at a really high level, then we need to work on the delivery systems. We need to make sure that the, the actual operations of the business are elevated because so many people are like, I need more leads. I need more leads. I need more leads. In some circumstances, that is the case. Yes. You need more business. You need more leads, but a lot of people also set the, set themselves up to fail because their marketing can't work because they actually can't serve more people. So we need we need to be able to kind of balance the two, which is why you know you said this earlier in terms of when I talked about social media being free. Um, I'm a really big believer that if you're not if you're not generating five, I would say like three to five deals a month organically from your organic social media, you're not ready to run paid traffic. Because so many people are spending money on ads that aren't tested and the messaging's not verified. It hasn't been tested organically. So if it's not working organically, why would you then go and put money behind it? It, it just, it, it fundamentally doesn't make sense. So um, a lot of the time what we would do is we take people through a, what we call a six lever audit, where we look for where the, op- the most opportunity is in the business. And in some cases it's going to be it's going to be an administrator. Now, if it, if that is an admin, then we go, then we get to go down the road of, is it going to be a virtual assistant? Is it going, does it need to be like a full admin? Is a transaction coordinator going to be enough for now? Because I think sometimes people go from zero to a hundred without actually looking at what they need. Most of the teams or most of the people who have struggled with scaling that I've spoken to will say, I, I tried to hire an admin, you know, she, that he or she came in, worked with me for three, three to six months. It didn't work out and I let them go. And now I'm doing everything myself again. 95% of the time, it was not the admin that was the problem. It was that you had a whole bunch of chaos that wasn't systematized, you didn't have everything organized and you pay, you hired someone who you want to pay 20 bucks an hour to do something that you haven't been able to do, which is clean it up and create systems. And that's an unreasonable expectation. When you bring on anybody, there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done in order to set that person up for success. And that is your responsibility. It's not their responsibility. Uh, And I think that a lot of the time it's backwards because a lot of people, like I said, don't come from a business background um, and they haven't done this before. 
And so a lot of the time too, what we see with agents is we real estate agents love to hire people like them. Right. But the last thing that any business needs is two sets of the same strengths and weaknesses. Right. Right. Yeah. You're just compounding all the good, but you're also compounding all the bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I think that like, again, it's a skill set. is every single time you want to, you know, up level your business, there is a balancing act of, you know, what needs to come first, what needs to be focused on first. Uh, again, if especially in a service based business like real estate, the delivery systems have to be rock solid before you try to scale anything. Um, so if you are your develop delivery systems or you are your business currently, then all of that has to be kind of taken out of you and standard operating procedures and systems and automations and all of those things have to be built so that, um, so that someone else can be you or someone else can take, take on some of the things that you're current, you're currently doing, you know, in a way that you're going to be happy with them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I totally agree with the you definitely do not want to hire somebody like yourself. And <laughs> we've all done it, especially in like the real estate game, because I feel, you know, like there's a lot of people that are very, you know, just kind of spur of the moment. Like I got to, I'm going out to this thing right oh, now. Yeah, I'm going to leave this over here. I mean, yeah. It's, you got to have somebody that can like put the blinders on and just get the job done. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think that, um, I, I think too that most people are really good people, you know, people, people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, if you are going to be the visionary and in the beginning, you're going to be the front, the front of the, the front facing person in the business, you need to hire someone who can do all the things that you can't do or that you're not good at or that you hate doing, right? Which is for most agents, it's going to be the administrative stuff. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, if you've read the book Rocket Fuel, every good visionary has an integrator. And, and I think that real estate has to be the same thing. Um, so often what we also see happen is people will then go out and find a partner that is has the same level. They're at the same level of business and they think that having this partner is going to help them scale. But again, that partner has the same skills. And then what ends up happening is you have two people doing one job and Real estate yeah. partnerships have a lifetime of like maybe four years. Yeah. What's it been like, you know, over the time that you've, you've been working with agents and I think it's really, I think what's really cool about, you know, what you do and, you know, these audits and, and how you work with people is that it is not cookie cutter. There's not a no. one size fit all for anybody. No. And I think that's, what's so cool is that you get to uh, learn different people's business models, people's personalities, what works for them. Yeah. Um, What's it been like, you know, speaking with these agents and, and helping them scale their businesses on so many different levels and different ways? I think that the coolest part of it is starting to see how real estate can be a vehicle to almost anything, right? Like nobody gets it. There, there's no single person that I have ever worked with who's been like my mission in life. And the reason I was put on this earth was to sell real estate. Like that's just, it's, it's not, it's not real estate is always going to be a vehicle to the lifestyle or, you know, the, the, whatever it is that that person really feels like they want out of their life. And it's just so cool to be able to see how one industry can lead to so many different lifestyles and lives and outcomes. And, you know, in our seven figure agent program, we have people who are building to sell. We have people who are, um, running their business remotely. We have people who are like the face and the brand and the, like they, they want this like big eight figure business and they want to be like the, like the face of it. We also have other people who, you know, have like from day one, they were like, I want to out of production, right? I want to be a business owner, but I don't want to be a business operator. And like every single one of these businesses looks a little different. And we get to, play the game of how does like in what order do we put this puzzle together so that you so that that person ends up five years down the road or three years down the road where they want to be and not where I think that they should be. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what's so cool about just real estate in general, not even necessarily the, you know, building the, uh, the actual teams or the businesses, but even just the way an individual agent goes about getting business, it's going to be so different. And so, you know, it, it 
you know, depending on your personality, how you interact with people. I mean, I've talked to, I had a whole interview, uh, with, you know, he was like the, the introverts guide to real estate. It was awesome. Like he was like, Nope, I don't like being, I, I am not a mixer person. I don't like no. being in a big group of people. I'm the same way. Like, Oh yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah. But then I'll talk to people that like their whole business, you know, all their business comes from those big, mm-hmm. you know, community gatherings and, and doing all that. And it's just such a cool industry because it, it, there is no one size fits all and no. you can really find your niche no matter what, you know, where you're at or, or how you want to. And it's really system. about like attracting your people and finding mm-hmm. those, like those people who resonate with you, who feel an affinity to you. Um, I don't want to work with anybody who doesn't like me. Right. There's enough business out there that I want to find like my, my raving fans, the people who, you know, like the way that I look at things and who want the kind of lifestyle that, you know, I've chosen. And I I think that that's, that's so interesting. I don't, I don't, I don't attract the people who really glorify the hustle, who like want to work really hard and work themselves to the bone because like, it's, it's just, it's not my philosophy. I am very much like, let's let, let's let tech do the work and let's automate as much as we can. And let's make this efficient as efficient as possible so that you can go to your kid's ballet recital and hockey game and, you know, go on, go go do, go play pickleball. That's what I want to do. I want to spend all my time playing pickleball. (laughs) So, you know, like go do the things that, that real estate and building this business allows you to do. Don't live and breathe the business. Right. Absolutely. Well, before I let you go, tell me about, um, uh, you know, your book, More Money, Less Hustle. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. And uh, obviously about the listing lab. Yeah. So um, More Money, Less Hustle, Becoming the Seven Figure Real Estate Agent is basically built, broken down into the seven pillars to seven figures that we like fundamentally use for everything. Um, it was a really, really fun book to to write. Um, I dictated most of it. So mm-hmm. it sounds very much like I'm just talking. Um, there, It's also available on audiobook if you can manage to listen to me for four hours. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't listen to my own voice for that long. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a... Uh, so, so many people have said that they just appreciate that book so much because it's a very different philosophy on mm-hmm. building the business, but it's broken down into really like tangible steps. Um, also in there, it comes with a free course. So there's actually trainings that come with it for each of the seven pillars. So it's not just the book itself. You read the book and then you can actually go through the the actual like the, the trainings that kind of come along with it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's available on Amazon, Canada and the U S and, uh, it's, uh, I never wanted to write a book. Yeah. It was never like, uh, Oh, I'm going to write a book one day. It was just that everyone kept asking me what real estate books do you recommend? And I couldn't find any that I really thought said what I wanted them to say. So I did it. <laughs> There you go. That's awesome. Hey, you know what? And I think uh, books are great. I, I'm a big proponent in, um, you know, entrepreneurs and business leaders having their own books because it, it just, that message is able to be carried out, you know, mm-hmm. much longer than, you know, a conversation or a podcast or whatever. And I think it's awesome. And, you know, having those resources for uh, your agents or somebody that's getting, you know, just getting to know you uh, totally. to be able to yeah. get their hands on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an, it's a relatively easy read. It's less than 200 pages. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate it. And we will absolutely, uh, be putting the link in the episode, uh, for that book. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. You too. I want to thank Jess for joining us today. She's always full of such great advice for not only the agents looking to scale their businesses up to the next level, but those new agents looking to set themselves up for success. Remember to check out the episode description for the link to Jess's book, More Money, Less Hustle, Becoming the Seven Figure Real Estate Agent. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.